Buongiorno, come stai? How are we all today? I have a Mont Blanc 149, the Pelican M1000. I understand that the ink windows are better than nothing, but still not great. How can I be sure that I'm completely filling my piston fillers? You're not, you can't. You cannot be sure, and you cannot typically fully fill a piston filler. So I'm just adjusting my microphone a little bit. There's the position, sorry for the noise. Uh, you, you, typically, there will be an air bubble, and there's no way you can, you can get rid of that un unless you do really uh, fancy things like you turn the pen over. I don't, do I have something like a piston filler that's clear? I don't think I do. No, not really. But the idea being, this is a this is a vacuum filler, so this is not a piston filler. But the idea being that you you would you know you you do the thing, you put it in the ink, and then you you move the piston up, right? And then you have ink in it. Now, what you could do is flip it over, and then very carefully screw the piston back up until there's a bit of ink coming out of the feed and then put it back in and then screw the knob again so that you pull up some more. But a completely good fill, you almost never, uh, you never obtain. And it doesn't really matter what kind of pen you're using. It could be a piston filler, it could be a vacuum filler, it could be a cartridge converter filler, but there's typically always an air bubble. So that's, that's just the reality of using that type of pen, really. Buongiorno, again. I um, don't have a whole lot of new things to show, but the Calgary Pen Club did a... Um, we did something called the Inquinox, and the Inquinox uh, was kind of an alternative to the Pelican Hub, which was cancelled this year because of the coronavirus. And we did get goodie bags, which was really kind, which several people had donated to. And I did get these two, which I will review. These are two inexpensive pens. So we have a Wing Sung 233, which is definitely reminiscent of initially, I would say something like, well, I wanted to say Parker 51, but I think it's more like a Schaefer, Schaefer Balance-ish. And then it has that Wing Sung wrapped around nib it's always quite cute. And then there is this, uh, which is something else. It's a 612, and I'm not 100% sure, but, but, but I have the strong suspicion that these two characters say hero. I could be wrong. Hero 612, is that, is that mirrored? It's mirrored on my end. Anyway, so the, it's even harder, but you know, I think it's a hero. Hero 612, that's what I'm gonna go with. And that is definitely another 51 type clone, both with aerometric converters. So it's kind of fun. So those two are coming up on the channel at some point. I think currently we're halfway uh, into December. No, oh, did I bend the nib? No, I did not bend the nib. <laughs> Sometimes it happens. Um, yeah, so that's coming up. Beyond that, I don't have anything new. I don't think I have what I did get in, I have shown you last time. And that's coming up. So that's Archie's, there was Archie's notebooks. Uh, the Archie's, no, yes, Archie's calligraphy. That should be interesting. Um, and that's pretty much it. What else? Do you think it's possible to mimic the look of Arco celluloid using modern resins? What is part of Arco's uniqueness come from the celluloid material and its manufacturing process? I have the feeling um, that that is not possible. That was the RO uh, that was sold by, uh, 
Was it Pineda or was it Visconti? That was just an acrylic and that didn't look like arcocelluloid in any way, shape or form. So I don't, I don't think that is something that can be reproduced. Do you still have the Parker Duo Fold, Akamon? And if so, how often do you use it? Yeah, I don't know how often I use it, but I, I do have it, yes. I don't I, like I don't keep tabs of how often every pen gets gets used exactly, but um, uh, it is it is there, yes. Thanks for your Nibmeister video. I got Salman Katak to work on a couple of pelicans, and they write amazing now. Yes, he does. Uh, he does very nice uh, work. I I enjoy the um, uh, Salman has has done a um, an architect nib for me. Uh, on the uh, Classic Pens LM1, and it's a very pleasant uh, pen to write with. He's done a, a really, really nice job on that nib. So, I, yeah, I have no trouble uh, recommending him and his work for sure. Are you enjoying your Leonardo sand? Do I have a sand? I think I have a copper. What are we talking about? The Grande? That I enjoy, yes. There's also this, but that was, uh, I think the, the finish was called Caramel or something, a messenger, and I enjoy that one too. Yeah. But I don't believe I have owned the sand finish, I think. But now it's all blurring together. I'm just checking this to see what I'm looking at. Yeah, no, I've never had a sand. No. Hello from London. Our pen show has just been cancelled. Yeah, I think pen shows may be a thing of the past. I don't foresee a lot of pen shows happening in 2021 either. Uh, not as long as this is going on. It's, it's, it's impossible. It's not just a matter of large gatherings, but it's also a matter of people touch all kinds of things. And that's just... I, I don't see how you would be able to to safely have a pen show in which you you just can guarantee people's safety. I just don't think it's possible. So yeah, it's um, it's a shame. It's a shame. But I, I do think it's in everyone's best interest, to be honest. Yeah, so someone says, it looks like a Hero 330 that I have. Are there multiple Hero pens that look like that? One thing I have found with some of the Chinese manufacturers is that they sometimes make pretty much the same pen, but have different names for it. But it's the same body, same nib, same everything. So I don't know if they, if the different companies manufacture pens in the same factory, for example. And that is why... Like why you end up with something like that. Um, then there are some pen companies that have, like, I mean, Hero, for example, has so many different models, many of which are variations on the Parker 51 theme. I mean, this is, this is one that has a little thing at the end as well. So it's then a little different uh, from some of the others I've seen that have a, a barrel very much like this. But this, is, this looks a lot like a 51 barrel. Uh, so, yeah, I don't know. I wouldn't be surprised if that's the case. Yeah. How do you divide your time between writing with your personal pens and testing pens you have received for review? Yeah, that's just a matter of, of making that division. Like new pens, that's kind of a work thing, right? That becomes a, a, a job, basically. And that's so, so that's separate time that, that I have to set aside. And then, of course, there are the, the, the personal pens. But then the personal pens, things can kind of, it doesn't have to be a very strict division. I mean, sometimes, I mean, I use my personal pens for work things, for example, but I can also use new pens that I'm testing for the same work things. So it kind of, it, it, it varies a bit in that regard. Um, and it just depends on what I am doing, what I am testing. 
I, for example, if I, uh, back in the day when I could still receive pens when there was still mail, um, I, uh, if, say, Applebaum lends me a $3,000 Mont Blanc, then I'm not sure I would really take that to work, right? Imagine that that rolls off a desk, etc. But these days, there is no more work. Like, there is no, there is no offices or anything along those lines. So now it doesn't really matter, right? So, that's, so that I, I can use those pens for work purposes that I'm doing from home as well. That's always an option, too. That's an interesting question from Jenny. What is the best way to fill a piston filler? I screw and unscrew three or four times to fill as much as possible. Is there something else I could do to better fill it? One thing that a lot of people overlook, but if you read the actual manuals that come with the pen, most pen manufacturers will recommend you to do pretty much that, what you do, but then also expel some ink. So wipe down the section and the nib and the feed then expel about three or four drops of ink. And almost no one does that, but that makes sure that you don't overfill the reservoir because that's another thing. We all want to have a large ink capacity, but if you have too much ink in a pen, then it can start to leak and that's not a good thing either. So typically you see that sometimes with, with some of the, the more inexpensive pens, that they have massive ink capacities. I'm thinking, for example, of Twisby, but then they also leak and people complain about the pens leaking. But what they are not doing with those massive capacity pens, because they have large barrels, but think of something like the 540, 580, etc. They do not actually expel that ink, even though it is in the manual. But people don't read the manual, so then they don't do that thing. And then ink is leaking into the cap, etc. Now, it is not said and if you do expel that ink, you will never get ink in the cap. You'll never have a pen that leaks. It's not like that. But it, it, it does make a difference. And some pens are finicky about it. For example, I have found a lot of leakage with the Waterman Karen that I owned. And I used with a converter, not a piston, but with a converter. Until I took it to Ackermann and Paul Rutter, the store manager, said, yeah, but do you expel the ink? And I said, no. I said, then you didn't read the manual. <laughs> I said, no, I didn't. He said, well, that's it. That's it. I love, I love Paul, by the way. That was not a bad conversation. It was a good conversation. But he said, but most people don't, right? So if you do that, you just take a couple drops out, not 10, like three or four drops, more than enough. But then that reservoir is not overfilled. It's not overflowing. And that can really make a difference. Maybe that helps. I love wet, broad nibs. I have loved using broad nibs, want to try double broad. Is that something that can be used for everyday writing? Any advice on the transition? Well, I think you can absolutely use a double broad nib for everyday writing, but, but of course it depends a bit on the size of your handwriting, right? Some people have smaller handwriting, some people have larger handwriting, uh, and it, it, it does make sense uh, uh, when you, uh, if you want to use a, a nib as broad as that, you're, you may have to increase the size of your handwriting a little bit, which is not necessarily a big deal. It's just something that you 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 kind of have to do then. Um, some people have larger handwriting naturally, and then it's not really a big deal. Beyond that, I think it is just a matter of practice. It will it may take a little bit of practice, but it's really not. I've I, at some point I switched from medium nibs to broad nibs. I've told that story a couple times. Um, and yeah, it's a little bit of a, a change. You make your handwriting a little bigger, but I, I would be inclined to say in an hour you're done because I mean, it's your handwriting. It's just, it just becomes a little bigger. So I would absolutely do it. I mean, it makes a bolder line you get, uh, especially if it's a wetter nib or if it's a somewhat, somewhat softer nib that has a little bit of bounce to it, you get a, um, a bit more shading often. Right, you, you you can't really. I I get people who tell me your your ink is supposed to shade, but when I put it in my pens, it, it doesn't shade. And I say, well, what are you using? Well, I'm using an extra fine nib and copier paper. Yeah, okay. Well, yeah, that answers the question, doesn't it? So I mean, you will see more shading in a broader nib because there is more ink on the paper. Like it's that it's that simple. So I would always do it. I think it's it's a it's a good thing. At the very least, it's a fun thing to try out once. And if it's really not your thing, well, then you can always sell that nib again. But I, I like it. And some companies, like, for example, uh, Pelican used to make really nice double broad and triple broad nibs that were really, really wet 
uh, really pleasant to use, fairly soft, and and that's a lot of fun. Uh, it's it's getting harder and harder. I find to get actual double brought nibs. I, I um, um, like for example, one second here. This is Hal's pen, the very very attractive Tamanuri Studio pen. But this is a um, Bach double broad. And although I love this pen and I think it's a very nice nib, I, I, I personally wouldn't describe this as a double broad. If I would have the, the say the, the, the Pelican M1000 nib, uh, that was a double broad, that would be twice as wide as this. This is, I would say, broad as best. And I've seen medium nibs that write like this. So I'm not complaining, but what I'm saying is it, it, it depends also on, on what, your, what your standard is. So companies will, will vary. Here you have... This is also a Bach titanium nib uh, on that, that 3D printed triangular pen I have. In my mind, this is as broad as that the writing of that other nib. And both are Bach, right? I don't have any, no, I don't have any other broads, double broads lined up there, but inked up. But yeah, so that's interesting too. So it also varies from company to company. It can, it can vary quite considerably. Pelican really had massive nibs. The, the Pelican Oblique uh, Triple Broad, for example, which they don't make anymore, or their Oblique, sorry, they're just a regular Triple Broad. They were huge, huge lines, way, way, way bigger than that. So I have often felt, but now I'm going off on a rant, so I'll keep it short. I've often felt that it would be really nice if companies would actually adhere to a standard. Like Broad is 0.7 millimeters. I'm making this up. A double Broad is one millimeter or something. So that when you buy something, you actually know what it is because you can see that even within a company, they, they just flip things around and that's really weird to me. This is never gonna happen because some companies make their nibs in house, etc. But if even like Bok is one of the main suppliers of nibs in the world, right? And if they can't even have that consistency, then I don't know, it's just weird. Uh, I'm just scrolling. Which pen has disappointed you the most? Uh, one, one, one pen and this always uh, leads people to hate me but they do anyway so that's not a big deal um one pen that that always uh, that has disappointed me is the parker 51 i have heard so many things about it and i understand that the design was revolutionary and that the the way it was constructed and all the materials used that, that it, it is it absolutely is but it, it does nothing for me it really does nothing for me so that is a pen that i i found somewhat disappointing, uh, which doesn't mean it doesn't have its place in history. It has a very important place in history, of which I'm also appreciative, but I don't own any 51s. I see absolutely zero need to own that pen because it, it really does nothing for me, really. Will we see another SBRE in color? Really don't see myself using brown. Probably not, no. It's a lot of hassle to come up with a new color and SBRE Brown works well, sells well. So there is no reason to, to change that for me. Are you excited for the new Furore Grande? Yes, I am. Uh, I think that will be a very interesting, um, uh, a very interesting new addition. I have liked the Furore model a lot. I like the rounded off ends and to see that in a Grande version, I think would be very attractive. Leonardo with Yovo nibs, what do you think about that? I don't think that's a bad idea. Is that what they're doing? I haven't, I haven't seen that yet. I have found that on a lot of the Leonardo pens out of the box, the nibs are on the dry side. And that is generally my experience with a lot of Bok nibs. And I find that Yovo nibs a little bit wetter from the start. Now, this is a matter of preference. Um, 
but I I do enjoy a wetter nib. So for me, I appreciate it if they would make that move. Yeah, yeah. Don't know if they would still be doing ebonite feeds then, though. But that was kind of interesting anyway, to have number six nibs with ebonite feeds. It's not very common anymore. Anyway. Hello, hello, Jelly Weasel. Hello, nice see you all. Um, what else? The pandemic is over at this point. No, I don't think so. People are still dying, so that's... I don't think 2021 will be back to normal. I don't think it's anything is back to normal until there's a vaccine. I have a pen channel and it allows me to test lots of pens, but at the same time takes a lot of time I could spend writing. Would you write more with your pens if you didn't have your channel? Well, this takes up a lot of time, yes. And 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 building up a channel, building up that audience, that, that will... Uh, that, that is something that takes a lot of time. Yes. So, yeah, if I would not be doing this, then I would not be sitting here either, and I would be doing something else. So, yes, the, the, the reality is it, it, it takes time, and it's something that um, uh, will, will take time to take off, and it also is a matter of a big investment. And if you want that channel to take off, it depends on what your, what your ambitions are, but then it will definitely take a lot of time. Um, I once saw a... And this is not exactly, this This most likely will not apply to your situation and definitely doesn't apply to my situation, but I'm just relating it. I once saw a video from Dave Canterbury, who is a, uh, he does videos on, on survival kind of stuff on, on YouTube. And I always find his style interesting. Uh, it's an interesting teaching style. He teaches survival courses and such. And he talked about having your own business and, um, because he got a lot of questions about that, like how much time does it take? Because he has his own his own um, the Pathfinder school and such. And he said, "Well, it's just basically like ten to twelve hours of work a day, every day, for the first years until it takes off, and then it may become a little less, but then it's still a lot of work." And I think people underestimate how much time this kind of stuff takes. Right? One review is twenty four hours of work because you have to test the pens, you have to record it, you have to edit the video, you have to take the pictures, you have to create the website post, you have to upload on YouTube, you have to schedule everything. Uh, that's 24 hours of work. So two reviews a week is 48 hours of work. Then there is uh, all the comments, page long emails, uh, uh, comments you receive on YouTube, on Twitter, on Instagram, on Facebook. Uh, th there's no time to respond to that all because this is not my job, right? My, my job is something else, and that is a nine-to-five job. So unfortunately, that's how it is. And that's many emails that I receive are along the lines of, where can I buy this pen? That goes unread into the bin, because I, I can't answer that. You have Google to help you answer that question. Uh, can you please recommend me 10 or 15 pens between $150 and $500 that have a, a super smooth, bouncy gold nib and iron piston filler? No that goes unread into the bin because I, I, I can't like, I cannot answer these kinds of, I don't have that amount of time. So uh, this is now starting to sound like I'm complaining. I'm not complaining. I'm just saying I have to make choices in what I respond to and what I don't respond to. And these days that means I respond to almost nothing because I simply don't have the time. There is so much coming in back when you start, that's easy. And there was a time I responded to every single YouTube comment, but given that I can get well over 100 a day, seven days a week now, that's no longer possible because people are also commenting on older videos, right? Not just on your new stuff, but on older videos. Sometimes people ask questions on videos that are eight years old. Yeah, I, I, I simply don't have the time. And that's, the, yeah, it's a time-consuming thing. I think that was all I was trying to say. I wasn't trying to sound like I was complaining because clearly I still enjoy doing this but you do have to make certain choices and people don't always understand those choices because they think this is no work. They think that if I, I do a 15 video review, that's 15 minutes of work and that the rest of my day is clear to answer their questions. But that's not the case. So there we have it. Again, I didn't mean to sound negative, nagging or complaining, but, but, but I do think it is good once in a while to point out the amount of work that goes into these kinds of things, right? All right.
Jenny says that she's not a fan of brown ink in general, but SBA brown ink is something I would use, especially for drawing. Well, I am, of course, somewhat biased, <laughs> but I do like it as a, as a brown ink, yes. Um, there are hardly any brick and mortar pen shops left here, hence that's why I'm missing pen shows. How about Canada? We do have, uh, uh, to the south of where I live, there is... Um, uh, Calgary, which has Reeds, and to the north of where I live is Edmonton, which has, uh, I haven't been there yet, S Stylus, Stilo, something. Uh, again, haven't been there yet, but they have a pen shop. Toronto has a few, but yeah, in the sport, like the, the, where, where I live, this is 100,000 people. There are no pen shops here. It's that simple. There are no pen shops. So yes, pen shows have served a function in the past. Um, again, I don't. I, I, I have the feeling that I sound particularly negative today. I'm, I'm not trying to sound particularly negative, but um, I wouldn't be surprised if pen shows for the foreseeable future are, are a thing of the past and are just not happening, right? Um, that's that's it. What else? What else, what else, what else? Caveco double broad nibs, I think are perfectly good now, although there were complaints on them uh, some years ago. Um, yes, I have, I have struggled considerably too with, um, with some of the Caveco nibs, especially in the broader range, there was a lot of over polishing and they were, uh, they were hard to use also often on the dry side. I don't know if that's been fixed. I don't remember the last Caveco I used. It's a while ago. It's a long while ago that I even reviewed a Caveco. I think they're fun pens. I, I sometimes wish they had a, a couple more models than the, the lineup that they have, but, that's you know that's just that's just me. Greetings from the Philippines. Greetings back. I really like the Pelican eight hundred black brown. Does the fine nib of the Pelican write the same as the Lamy two thousand medium? Yeah, I don't know. Like these are always like does nib X write exactly like Y down to the last micrometer? I don't know. Again, there is a lot of variation even within companies. Often Pelican nibs are a bit on the broader side, but Lamy is not consistent either. So I cannot answer this question. You have to try out the pen and, and then see, uh, because it also varies from nib to nib. I've used some Lamy medium nibs that wrote like broads. I've used Lamy fine nibs that wrote like broads. I've used Lamy fine nibs that wrote like an extra fine. So I, I, I just don't know. I don't know. What else? Thanks to your video, I got a William Shakur pen. Good. I'm glad you enjoy it. Yeah, they're strange pens. They're not for everyone. Here is but the initial one that I had. It's definitely not for everyone. It's a very large pen, and the shape is not for everyone. Um, I have found them to be comfortable and pleasant to use. But uh, again, it's, it's not for everyone. Large pen and interesting shape. I've been enjoying the challenge of writing larger with my yard lead. You have a yard lead? I didn't know that. <laughs> no, she bought it for me. I actually write pretty small. Wrote five essays and one sheet of paper once. Surprise, I didn't fail for that, but I actually got an A. Well, you see, there you go. You can do it. And it is that. It really is that. The, the, the writing with broad nibs is not as scary as some people, I, I believe, think it is. It's, it's really not that bad. It, it, it's, it's very doable. You can, you can do it. At what price point a pen becomes a writing instrument? Yeah, whatever you want, right? Like it's, it's, yeah. Does the refilled ink get very dark if a fountain pen has not been cleaned? Well, that depends a bit on what ink was in there. If there was a very dark ink in it, then yes, obviously whatever other ink you're going to put in there is going to be darker. If it was a very light ink that was in there, then I, I wouldn't necessarily expect any issues. It's probably wisest to just clean the pen and not have the issue in the first place, right? Um, but yeah, 
there is definitely an effect of not cleaning pens on the ink that you uh, uh, that you do not clean if you do not clean the pen. What inspired your ink? Uh, well, I wanted a brown ink because of my last name. And the process of uh, dye mine is that they just ask you for a Pantone color. That's just a, like a standardized color system. So I selected what I thought would be nice. I sent them that specific color and then they mix something that is in their mind as close to that as possible. I immediately liked uh, what, um, what I saw. And, and so we went with that. So that was all I just, and I had just had some, some indicators. I wanted something preferably that shaded and I want something that is safe. I don't want to be in a position where, where someone emails me and says, I put, I put your ink in my pen and now the pen is destroyed, which some ink brands do. Um, but I personally have some scruples uh, regarding that. So I would, I would prefer it if my ink did not do that. So in that case, uh, they, they, yeah, with Dye Mine, I've never really had issues uh, or heard of issues of people having destroyed pens. So I was, I was happy with the result. So that was pretty much the only inspiration. Wasn't that, it wasn't that I was going for this particular bronze statue from ancient Greece or something like there was nothing along those lines. I just wanted a warm color that ideally would shade well. And I think they succeeded in, in creating something like that. I'm looking for a tea colored ink. Uh, Lida Te is disliked in many reviews, so looking around for one. No, not really. Uh, there is Lida Te, indeed, as the name suggests, that is kind of a tea colored ink. I think the reason a lot of people dislike that is that it's very dry. Now, of course, you have solutions to that. You could add the tiniest, tiniest, tiniest amounts of dishwashing detergent to, um, uh, to that ink, and it should become wetter. Uh, there's also the um, White Lightning from Vaness, which is some sort of solution they make, and uh, you can put that tiny bit of that in the ink, and that also works wonders. I've reviewed that stuff, and um, yeah, that's it. But that is, that is indeed the most tea-colored ink, because especially when dry, it has a very nice matte look to it. And that may sound weird, but it's that really struck me. It's, it's a matte look, and it's, it does look like dry tea. I am planning to purchase a vintage pen. What brands and or models do you recommend? Um, well, there are a lot of options to pick from, but I, I, I would say that Waterman is often a pretty safe bet because you can get a black hard rubber Waterman for not too much money and you can figure out if that's something that you like. Now, there are all kinds of models. I mean, there are many, many brands, so you have dozens and dozens of things to pick from. But something like a Waterman 52 or a 52 and a half V, something like that. 52 V, 52 and a half. I don't know if that's 52 and a half V. I'm not a vintage guy. Um, but those, that is a solid model. And again, if you get a very uh, pretty mottled ebonite, well, then it's going to, to cost some more. But if you just get a black hard rubber, especially if it's faded a bit, it may not look very nice or not look super attractive, but it will write. And then you, you don't have to spend much. I've got pens like that for $20 or something, which had great nibs, but just were just somewhat faded black hard rubber. And if you don't care much about the looks, then that's a really good way to, I think, to try out um, uh, vintage. Ellen says the Leonardo messengers are Yovo nibs. That's interesting. I have, I didn't know that. I have to read up on that now. Thank you. I think mine was a little, I don't remember, out of the box. Messenger, have to ink that up, haven't used it in a while. Any tips on selling old pens? I have a shade for 300 cigars I want to sell. Yes, sell them. Uh, there are many avenues. There is virtual pen show on Instagram. There is the Fountain Pen Network. There is eBay. There is all kinds of things. Set a reasonable price and then sell it, right? Like it's it's a, uh, there's a market, an aftermarket for pens and uh, just use the, the, the usual channels, I would say. Because sometimes like, I sometimes get questions from people along the lines of, would you recommend putting up a note in my supermarket that I have a pen for sale? Yeah, sure. 
if you want to take five years to sell it, then I guess that's a good way to do it. But that's going to take a very long time, right? Like it's, it's, yeah. I sound, I've got the feeling I sound really cranky today and I'm very sorry, but like I, yes, do that. Virtual pen show typically works pretty well. No guarantees, but it works pretty well because it is viewed by an audience that is relevant, right? That is looking for pens for sale. So that I think is a good way to do it. Found it by network is a good way to do it. Um, yeah, those those kinds of places work well. Now as to the pricing, the golden standard, I don't know how many people actually stick to, but the uh, read this in Peter Twile's book, which I always found good. If the pen is in mint condition, ask 100% of what you paid for it, which I'm assuming they're not, uh, just assuming because they've been used. If there are some micro scratches, some things, 75%. If there is bigger scratches or dings or dents, whatever, 25%. And if it is broken, then 0%. Right? Then that's its value. Like if it's a broken pen, people buy broken pens too. Sometimes they, you know, the barrel is cracked, but they need a new section for their pen. So they buy it anyway and they throw out the cracked barrel, the, you know, the, that kind of stuff. It works too. I hope that helps. Alan says, hello, thanks for everything, but yard work beckons. Hello, hello, Alan, thank you. Yard, I have no yard, so I don't have any yard work to beckon. That's kind of convy. Um, what, what else, what else? Have you tried a pilot FA nib with flexible nib factory ebonite feed? No. But I will say that I have uh, heard extremely good things. Sorry, I'm not staring at the camera. I'm just rereading the question. I have heard extremely good factory about... I've heard extremely good things about the flexible nib factory feeds. And people... Uh, I'm pretty sure that Aziza had one at some point. I haven't tried it. Uh, but because I'm not a flexi... I'm not a flexi person, really. Um, but... I've heard really good things about it, that they work really well. So even though I have not used them myself, based on secondhand knowledge from people I know and trust, I would say, yes, uh, that that is most likely going to work pretty well. Yeah. Yeah. Did you see the new Leonardo Grande with a number eight nib? Number eight nib I have not seen. God damn it. I need another pen. I will check it out. Nibsmith, huh? Mm. I'm going to check it out. Thank you. I really like what Salvatore is doing with pens that are relatively affordable, are also very attractive. Yeah. Yeah, overscrolled. You would think that at this point I would have this pen down, but I don't. Greetings from Belgium. Sorry. So sorry. And I think of Belgium, I think of Cluzo. Not Inspector Cluzo, but the band Cluzo. Well, um, thank you for your great content. I discovered your channel very recently and I really appreciate it. Well, I, that's very kind of you. Thank you. I appreciate it. It's amazing in, to me how, how the channel has taken off so much and it's taken years, but I mean that it has taken off so much and that people from all over the world are enjoying it. I mean, right now we have people in the chat from the Philippines, from, from Europe, from the U S from Canada, from it, it's amazing to me that such an audience is attracted to my insane uh, uh, blabbering basically. So I appreciate it. Uh, here we have greetings from Washington, D.C. Love your videos. Keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you. More to come. I'm already looking forward to the uh, greatest of all time video for 2020 because I do think I have some fun additions this year. What else? What else? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Let's bitch about online teaching. Yeah. Uh, yes, I. Uh, a couple of my friends are in the same situation as well as you are and as I am too. Uh, it's 
the online teaching is very difficult. Uh, I, I do like it and on purpose, I, and I'm very happy I did. I have made my classes what, what, what my institution calls synchronous, so that means that they are live. So it's a live stream kind of like this, um, which I like because in winter when we moved online, I recorded all the classes and then you have zero interaction. And if you do have a, a, that synchronicity, then at least students can ask questions on the spot and you have the somewhat the feeling you're in a, a classroom, but it remains a matter of you staring at the webcam and there is no one else and you have gray balloons with student names that, and that's the students and that's it. And that's not their fault. It's no one's fault. It's just the way it is right now. And I do think this is the wisest decision, but yeah, it's something else. Uh, I really hope that in winter we may be able to go back to face to face, but we will see. I await patiently. Uh, can I reproduce it in Greek? Ton on ton tamenestin efimin tade uk efimin. Some things are within our control, other things are not within our control. That is Stoicism 101. So we all hang in there, right? If you weren't a fountain pen reviewer or teaching in neuroscience, what would your alternate profession be? I've always kind of fancied being a porn star, um, but I'm, I'm guessing that's a no. Um, given that I have a PhD, I'd already selected the name, PH Dick. I thought that would be... Uh, but, you know, given that one can always dream, right? Um, no, in all seriousness... No, I, I don't. Uh, there are other things I have considered. Um, while I was working on my PhD, I collaborated with psychiatrists. And of course, the difference between a psychologist and a psychiatrist is that a psychiatrist has an, an MD, a medical doctorate, and a psychologist is not a medically trained professional. But the research I was doing was fairly medical in nature because it was psychopharmacology. So we gave healthy volunteers medication. It's very interesting, but I had to learn all sorts of skills. I had to learn how to put in IV drip and I had to measure their blood pressure and the heart rate and do all those kinds of things. Um, and I did think at that point, you know, medicine would have been a very interesting thing to study as well. And um, so if, if it wouldn't be cognitive neuroscience, if it wouldn't be fountain pen stuff as it was a hobby really, I wouldn't mind having studied medicine um, because I find that a very interesting profession, plus it is insane what kind of advances uh, are made in that, in that profession. A good friend of mine uh, lost his hearing years ago and told me that he's getting a new type of, a relatively new type of implant, which is not a cochlear implant, which another friend of mine has. It's not, it's not that, but it's something else. It's like, um, um, a, a bone conducting implant that you have and that transfers sound. And I think it's just amazing. Like these kinds of developments are so cool and are, are progressing at such a rapid rate. I, I find that really interesting. So I think that would be, yeah, that, that, that would be cool as well. And there are many other things, but. So if your name was SBRE Black, would you endorse SBRE Black? I guess I would have to in it. I guess I would have to. The caffeine is kicking in, by the way, so I'm already feeling a lot better, and I feel less grumpy. Thank you for putting up with me. Uh, yes, I think so. SBRE Black. It could, it could, yeah. But it won't happen because my name is not SBRE Black. All right. I am using Amethyst de Lural in a small Faber-Castell fountain pen. Do you think should be any special consideration concerning care of the fountain pen. Amethyst de Lural, yeah, that was one of their weird J. inks. Clean the pen really well. Just clean it really well. You should be fine. If you have access to an ultrasonic cleaner, just throw the whole section in without the converter. That's a separate piece. Whole section. It'll be fine. Even if you don't have that, just flush it, just with water. Converter, water, no problem. Hello from Vancouver, Canada. What's the best paper out there apart from Clairefontaine Rodia? Clairefontaine and Rodia. 
And if that is not accessible or not desirable, there are other options such as, for example, uh, black and red makes Oxford paper, which is very nice and very inexpensive, but is, I think, more a European thing than a, well, that's called Oxford, but I think it's made in Germany. Um, but they, that is fantastic paper that is super smooth. It's coated. It doesn't feather or bleed. It's, it's great. And I, I used to buy A4 notepads for, I think, 250 euros. It's insane how cheap it is. And it was superb paper, but you won't have access to it. So other options, of course, are the famous slash infamous Tomway River in either, what is it, 52 or 68 grams per square meter. Those are very nice papers. Um, yeah. And many others. I just reviewed Archie's calligraphy uh, paper. It's, the review is not online yet, but the review is shot and, and, and planned. It's a fantastic paper. I was very impressed. It's heavy. And I'm blanking on the exact weight now, 90 or 100 grams, I want to say. It's, it's heavy paper, doesn't bleed with the wettest of nibs. It has an interesting uh, lining that you, like a ruling type thing that you may or may not like, uh, but it was superb paper. So there are options. Options. Or we clocked our kinder. I don't know if you can hear that. Did you hear that banging in the background? So there it is again. Let me tell you a short story. Once upon a time, there was a short story. The end. No. Um, when we got here, we started to hear that. And I couldn't figure out what it was. And I thought it was neighbors because it sounds like... Like that intensity. And I, um, I thought it was neighbors putting together an Ikea bookshelf or maybe clubbing each other to death, you know, something along these lines. But I couldn't figure out what it was. But but then we noticed the correlation between wind and that. And I started to hear it right above the stove, which has a, a fan. And then we figured out that in the wall right there, it's right, it's close to this room, there's an air intake or I guess exhaust because the fan goes through the ceiling and puts out its stuff, its fumes there. Flogiston, I suppose, comes out, but with hard wind from a specific direction, it est that direction, something starts to flap. And then that fan starts to make a noise like that not uninterruptedly it's gusts of wind so i called the building manager and i said hey yo diggity dog i got this issue and she said i'll pass it on to the that's the dude greg who does everything here that needs maintenance and greg called me and greg said oh yeah it's a known problem eh yeah nothing we can do about it it's uh because the building is pressurized, eh? So whenever you hear it, open a window. I was like, it's Alberta. What if it's minus 40? Yeah, nothing you can do, eh? So it does work. You open the window, things, I don't know, depressurize, and then the, the fan beating stops. But it can be a little spooky. So I like to freak out guests by saying, oh, that's, I think it's a poltergeist or something. I don't know what that is. But then I'm a giant asshole, so that kind of makes sense. Moving on. Have you seen the new Opus 88 Jazz? Um, I would consider it. I have a, a little list I may have to send to Applebaum. Uh... Furore Grande. What's that? Opus 88 Jazz. You see, jazz is like jello pudding. I'm sorry. Sometimes the cause still comes out, but he's a convicted rapist, so I don't want to do that anymore. But sometimes it just happens. It is a problem, though. It is a problem because I have older videos. This is all adults talking to each other. So I have older videos 
where I used to do my fairly bad Bill Cosby impersonation because it just comes out. And there were times I would be early on, like I would be in a mall with Aziza and, and Bill Cosby would come out. So we'd be walking and you would get something like, do you think maybe we should have a cup of coffee, you see? But now I can't do that anymore because he's a convicted rapist. So it's a problem because I still sometimes have that just come out. And you can still find him in some older videos. I'll leave it at that. What else? What do you think about the Laban antique pen? Would you add it to your collection? Uh, had one, reviewed it, but I think that's I think that was accidentally that went public, but it was supposed not to go public yet. Um, it was a nice pen. Had a very nice nib. I gave it away because I didn't. I don't. I don't. I don't, know. I don't use all those pens, but. Uh, very nice, very nice, uh, very, very smooth nib that was really very pleasant to use. So I would recommend it. I wouldn't add it to my personal collection. I didn't like it enough for that. The reason for me was it was fairly skinny and it was skinny to a point where I didn't find it for me super comfortable. But that's a personal thing. Writing performance, which I think was more objective, was super smooth, very pleasant. If that is objective, I think it is objective. Apart from the world's smallest pen that you did a few years ago, what, in your opinion, is the hardest thing you have reviewed, if you can remember? Yeah, give me one second to think about that. Yeah, that tiny, that, that the smallest pen that's that's cute, that's a waterman that's about this big, and it's the, the diameter of, I would say, a good toothpick. It's a very it's a cute pen, the Waterman Dole pen. You can you can check that out. It's kind of a cute review because it's so, such a weird thing. Um, what I find hard about reviewing is... Most of the time, the pens that I get one way or another, people lend them to me, companies lend them to me that I've purchased, they work quite well. And then I don't want to be too negative, but of course, you know that from the start, I've always said, I'll tell you what I like about it, what I don't like about it. There's a difference between saying what you don't like about it and basically crushing something to death because you don't like something or because you you um uh how do i put that you have something against that pen but you have to try i'll, I'll make this more concrete because I, I feel like this is incomprehensible um i think that is important to try to have that objectivity now here's all i'm trying to say i recently reviewed the noodles triple tail i have had Especially recently, you say in the pawn sets, I've had pretty bad luck with noodles. I've had noodles inks destroy some of my pens. So these are objective things. If a noodles pen does not write, that is a problem because you're selling a, a defected product. And noodles is not the only company, right? I've had Visconti's that didn't write, right? Right. Right. Um, that is something you should complain about. This is this pen does not write. But then there are also more subjective matters. I do not subscribe to many of the political views of Nathan Tardif. But I'm not reviewing Nathan Tardif. I'm not reviewing his political views. Everybody is entitled to have specific views of the world. So when I recently reviewed the Triple Tail, Nuda's Triple Tail, because I got a lot of review requests for that, what is hard is that I have to put Basically, human nature aside, that sounds like a really grand thing to say, but I have certain feelings about the brand Noodlers. I have certain feelings about 
Nathan Tardif, but that cannot shine through. At this point, it's a hard reset. I have to look at the triple tail with completely fresh eyes and say, okay, yes, I've had several Ahabs that didn't work. Yes, I've had several Nippon sets that didn't work, and I've seen and I've heard about it from others, but that doesn't matter right now. This is a hard reset. This is a completely new pen for me to try out. And it turned out that that pen actually wrote very well. Well, that's cause to be happy. Maybe they fixed some of the issues they had with this different uh, uh, shape, nib and feed, for example. Maybe that has really made a big difference, and that's great. So that is something I find hard because, and I also commented on that in that review, but that is something that makes it difficult to review stuff because you have to try and put your personal preferences aside. Um, I'll give you one more quick example, then I'll, I'll, I'll move on. But Classic Pens LB6, I love it. I love everything about it. But it's also a massively expensive pen. Is it really worth that value penny by penny? Yeah. If I say no, then I am saying that Paul Rossi, who carves those things by hand, is not worth that amount of money, that his work is not worth that amount of money. Well, that's hard too. So I don't want to say that, but we cannot deny the fact that's a very expensive pen, right? And striking a balance in those things, that is hard. And that's another thing, because I touched on that earlier, that I think sometimes people are not fully aware of how many of those kinds of considerations come into the reviews and the whole review process. So another way to approach a review and I, I, I typically try to not uh, use this kind of language on this channel, but I'll, 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 I'll moderate myself a little bit. Um, you can approach every review from the premise of this pen is a piece of shit and I'm going to break it down. Or you can look at it and say, well, again, if there are objective flaws, if the pen doesn't write, well, yeah, that's, that's you, you cannot make that any better that's then a flawed defunct product but if you think if your attitude is i'm going to approach this negatively i'm going to nag about everything i don't like about this pen then i think what you should ask yourself is what service are you doing the community someone made that pen right whether it's a company that churns out ten thousand of those a day or whether it's someone who's who spent 100 hours making this in the attic so to speak what service are you doing by taking such a negative approach? But of course, at the end of the day, you also have to be honest. And again, I like to think that I am. I point out, I think this is grossly overpriced. I think, that, well, this doesn't write, so this is a serious issue. This does smell weird. I mean, yeah, I'm sorry, the, the triple tail is, is, is uh, I'll come back to that one, but I mean, like, it's just because it's a good example, but people say, oh, it's a new material, it doesn't smell. No, it does smell. Don't, don't, I mean, don't make it seem like something it's not. It still has the noodle smell. It's just less strong than what it used to be. So these are just some considerations. This was a lot of, a lot of talk about that. I hope I haven't bored you to death. But like that is, that is the kind of stuff that I, I struggle with sometimes. Have you had to deal with fatigue or cramping when you started with fountain pens? Um, yeah, but that was mainly because I was holding the pens in some sort of vice grip because that's kind of what you have to do with, with ballpoints, especially cheap ballpoints. But once you learn to not do that and just relax your hand, then it becomes a lot easier. Another thing is that someone like Jake Whiteman would say, well, then you're writing with your wrist. You should be writing with your shoulder. But I, I mean, I do not, I do not write like this when I write my grocery list, right? So that, that can also help. Devon says, I have never had two nibs write the same. None of my Twisbees, Cavecos, or Leonardos ever have the same nibs. I think that's part of the fun. Yeah, that's another way to look at it, right? You, like, you never really know. <laughs> that's true. I think the problem... Um, the problem... 
with it is that if you are buying, if you say, well, I have very small handwriting, I really want an extra fine or a fine nib, and you buy a Lamy Safari, and one day the fine is abroad, and the other day the fine is an extra fine, that becomes a problem because people don't know what to expect. But I like the approach of thinking about this as just a challenge. Uh, yeah, Some kind of a fun surprise. Yeah, uh, this follows up on that. I quite like Lamy, but I thought I was going slightly mad. The nib widths can be very inconsistent. I agree. Exception is the Lamy 1.1 perfect every time. Yeah, I wonder if that is because they just, it's an untipped nib. So I wonder if they, they're, the tolerance of making that is easier than with the round tipping that they just grind. All of that, I think, is just done machine by machine. Though, so I don't, I don't understand how those tolerances are, are like that. But anyway, um, what else? Oh, I wanted to ask. I've been experimenting with arm writing recently rather than finger and noticed that some of my pens feel very different. I love thicker pens for finger, but slim seems fine. Slim seems fine for arm writing. Have you ever tried it? Any thoughts or opinions? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's more fluid but harder to learn. Yeah, I have tried it too. But again, like I, I, I'm not a master penman by a very long shot, and that's how it's going to stay. And this, the whole shoulder move, I'm really exaggerating now. But I mean, like that, for everyday writing, it's it doesn't work for me. I, I write the way I write. But I understand what you mean. Um, nice. We've got your mint caveco. Yes, I remember you buying that. We put a stupidly broad calligraphy nib in it. No problems. Yeah, yeah, that can be that can be fun. That is a nice thing. That is something I've really always enjoyed about caveco. That they have such a nice, easy to interchange nib system. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bound notebooks abound at school supply stores. Great op for all people to keep journals. Of course, the paper usually is not great for fountain pens. Yes, please recommend an ink for this paper that won't bleed badly. I have always really enjoyed Waterman. It used to be Florida blue, but now is Serenity blue. I found that to be a really, really well-behaved ink. And... I always have no issues recommending that. That's a very well-behaved ink. At some point, of course, it doesn't matter what paper you like, what ink you're using. Some paper is so bad that it will always feather. Yeah, in those cases, it, it doesn't matter. But I, I found the Waterman to be very reliable. I've just got a reform vintage pen. It writes like a dream. Yeah, those are not bad. Um, uh, the, 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 the 1745, I think, the green ones that, that, that look sort of a little bit like a pelican, but they're not really... Uh, they are nice. I had one too. They are quite nice. And you can disassemble them too, which is nice for cleaning. I tried that add tiny drop of dish soap last week and it seems to work. It made the ink wetter. Yes, it does. Um, it, it does, but you have to, the tiniest drop. I once put a full drop in a converter. That was way too much. That ink just, it lost, that was lite. It lost its shading and it was... I don't want to say leaking out of the pen, but it was too too wet. It just didn't, like, it didn't, it was too much. That can happen too. Have you tried Reynolds fountain pen? I don't think I have. I don't think I have. Reynolds. Maybe I have, but it doesn't immediately ring a bell. Thank you, Jenny. I appreciate that. I'm trying to be me. What was your favorite new pen day experience? Um, I don't have that many more new pen days at the moment. I just haven't really received a lot. That was the oh, that was the uh, classic pens LB six, which I've mentioned a few times now, which I am very fond of. And I do really like, and that one is very special. Uh, I've waited for that for a long time, and it was very, very nice to uh, to to get that. Uh, and and I I have really been enjoying that pen. That's basically been inked since I got it, and keeps being reinked. So, yeah, very very nice. Which pen hurts the most as a weapon? A tactical pen. 
There was a tactical fountain pen made by Schrade. I don't know if they still make it. There was also, uh, there are many tactical pens ballpoints and they are meant to hurt. What else? Are virtual pen meets a thing? Should they be? Yes, they are. We've been doing that for weeks at the Calgary Pen Club. I don't, I don't attend every meeting personally myself, but yes, we used to go out for lunches on Saturdays, but that has stopped due to the plague. Uh, so, yes, uh, we do do Zoom meetings. Um, and it's by no means the same. Because obviously part of a, the fun of a pen meet is trying out other pens. You just can't do that in Zoom. But you get to hang out a bit, right? So there we go. What else? Did you see Breguet fountain pens? I have never seen them. Sorry, we would have to check them out. What do you think about Esterbrook Junior pocket pen? I have not tried it. Yeah. Which notebooks are you currently using? Um, I am using for work the um, Lockby. Sorry, I had to think about that one. Lockby, which is set up nicely because you can put different notebooks in. So for different purposes, I have different little notebooks and it's Tomway Riffer. So it's very pleasant to write on. What else? What else? Little confused with the Nakaya nib option. Soft, medium, flex, I understand, but does the elastic make it more flex? Yeah, that is confusing. Um, yeah, there is all this terminology that we have had discussions about a while ago. Um, about elastic and spring and bounce and flex and flex if I remember is what the pen does and elasticity is how like how much it springs back I think so yeah that is complicated the uh, best thing would be to contact Nakaya and actually ask them right what they how they describe these things what else Rhodia 80 grams per square meter squared a4 plus for a Pound 20 on Amazon right now. That's a good deal. Yeah. Yeah, Oxford. Oh, interesting. Kiara says, Oxford is a good paper and handles ink fairly very well. However, my Iroshizuku inks feather like crazy on it. Maybe the coating, that being a lubricated ink, maybe it has something, maybe it has something along, like, like something to do with that. I don't know. What else? I love the way you savagely roasted hate comments on YouTube. Yeah, for my own sanity, sometimes I have to. The best thing to do with these kinds of things is to not respond, as by far the best. But sometimes when you get five or 10 of those in a row, uh, then to stay on top of things, uh, yeah, that's how it is. Where I live, says Jenny, there are two rows of apartments situated, situated so that when it's windy, the area between them becomes a wind tunnel. Wind whistles horribly and sounds like the world's about to end when it storms. Uh, the thing is that, uh, yeah, I, I can relate you to you another short story. There was a Dutch university, and I'm now figuring out, trying to remember which one it was. It was Wageningen or Nijmegen. Anyway, there was, the building was a tall building, was constructed in such a way that there was this massive, basically wind tunnel was created, and there was this massive gust of wind coming 
around one corner. And in the Netherlands, a lot of people, including a lot of students, ride a bicycle and you could, with a specific wind from a specific angle, specific angle, you could just sit down and wait. And one by one, you would see these cyclists, I'll do with my hand this way, you would see these cyclists come up and then they would just smack down. They would be smacked down by the wind. It was very unfortunate. Um, and they never really, there was not much they could do to fix it. But if you weren't aware of that, you just be caught unaware, obviously, because you weren't aware of it. But I mean, like you, you wouldn't expect it, and people fell, like they actually were, were just that were blown sideways, which was uh, very unfortunate. So yeah, it happens. Do we still own cats? Not at the moment. Yeah. What modern pen would you consider being a future classic? Like how the Mont Blanc 149, Lamy 2000, etc. are classics and timeless. Well, I think the Pelican M1000 is another one. To be honest, M800, M1000 doesn't really matter. I think both of them are, are fairly classic. Um, I think Visconti has created something quite iconic with the Homo sapiens model, especially when they use that magma that, that, that's really neat. Um, or lava, what is it? Um, is it lava? Has it come out of the earth yet? I don't know. That, that, that. I thought was quite revolutionary. And I think there are many others. Uh, I find that the big brands, Schaefer, Waterman, Parker, I don't feel they're coming up with the most spectacular stuff at this point in time. But of course, there's still, and Parker has just redone all its lines, right? So there is the, uh, the dual fold, which remains, a, um, I think, a classic, classic pen. Uh, yeah, I'd say those are all pretty good good options. They also remain in in they, they remain for sale, right? And the fact that that they keep making them does suggest to me that they um, that it remains interesting to people to have those pens, and they've been around for a long time. So I think that also kind of makes them classics. Yeah. I can look into a Parker Sonnet, the new model. Yes. Just going to scroll. Wish me luck. I have exp I was so close. I have experienced that often good branded pens have not the best quality control of the nib. So I bought a Leonardo Furore with a very bad nib. Do you know why they don't care on that? Yeah, who cares about anything these days, right? Um, what else? How do I find a nib master and when would you send a nib to be repaired? I've done a video on that, so you can check it out. Is SBRE Brown double the price of other inks by the brand? If so, why? No. What pen accessories would you recommend to people that are new to fountain pens and to veterans? Well, you know, there are some there are some things that I think can really be very nice to add to 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 the pen. I really really don't like the term pen hobby. I don't know why, but I always I don't know, I always I don't know. I just find it sounds weird. Um, but if you are in the pen hobby, there are some things that I think are are quite nice to uh, uh, to own a good pen case. And that depends a bit on what what your personal background is, right? I have some leather pen cases, but if you're a vegan, for example, or you don't like to use cow leather, uh, then there are other options. If it's really the cow leather, there are Van der Spec makes a Dutch company makes some very nice ostrich leather uh, cases, for example. Though ostrich leather is something else, so you have to kind of like that. Um, there also are very nice nylon options, uh, the, the Knock Co, for example, but also uh, Lockbee makes some nice wax canvas options. I think a good pen case is, is, is worth buying. Another thing that you could consider getting if you use specific um, uh, notebooks, notebook sizes that you like, is to get some sort of leather cover, which will be can be a somewhat more expensive purchase. It's a good leather cover, can easily set you back well over 100, 200, sometimes 300 dollars. 
but it will also last you a very long, long time, especially if you take good care of it. And that is nice because it adds more personality because you can carry around a notebook. Typically, there are some pockets so you can you can kind of set that up as a system that you can carry around. And that I think is 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 very nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What else? What pen do you bring to the grocery store to check off items? Yeah, to be honest, I, I when I do make a list, which I don't always do, but when I do make a list, I do write it with a fountain pen, but I never bring a fountain pen to a grocery store. It's like bringing a knife into a gunfight. It's just, no. What are you currently recommending for an intro level gold nib? Something that works well in a soft, bouncy fine that is good value for the price. Yeah, there are so many options. It also depends a bit on how you define intro level. I mean, for some people, anything over $5 is unacceptable. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I will say I have found the the gold Lamy nibs to actually be very nice. And also in my, my experience to be a bit more consistent in, in width than the steel nibs are we talked about a couple of times now. Um, they're not bouncy though. They're quite rigid. But I do find you know, I do find them to be a good value for the for the price. Yeah. I've been in the hobby for about two years and I'm looking to buy my first gold nib pen, but I'm worried of spending 160 on something like the Pilot Custom 74, the Platinum 3776 Century, only to end up with something not terribly amazing. Are my concerns unfounded or is this something first time gold nib buyers go through as well? Well, it's not. We've had this discussion before in these kinds of videos. The biggest issue is people's expectations are unrealistic. A gold nib is still a nib. It's still a fountain pen. It need not be a night and day difference. I've used some steel nibs that are as good or better than some of the gold nibs I've used. I've used some gold nibs that have fastly outperformed any steel nib I've ever used. So it really depends on the nib. But it's not, it's not going to be like, well, a steel nib is like riding a monocycle, what do you call that, a unicycle with a leak tire, and then a gold nib is driving some sort of super fancy Rolls Royce. Like it's, it's not going to be like that. And that's an unrealistic expectation that people have. And then, yeah, then they are disappointed. Like expect what is realistic. You're buying another pen with another nib. And that's it, really. So, yeah, you're likely to be disappointed if your experience is that it's going to be an astronomical difference and you will be blown away, and it's going to be the, the most amazing thing you've ever experienced because it won't be like that. So have realistic expectations. Are certain things going to be different? Yeah. If you buy Pilot Custom 74, then the nib is probably going to be a bit softer than the steel nib that you are using now. If you buy a 3776 Century, unless you buy a soft nib, but for example, if you buy the music nib, there is not going to be any springiness to that nib. So it really depends. And the only way to do it is to go to a brick and mortar store and try out a bunch of pens. And if that's not an option, then I don't know what to tell you. Because it's the only way to actually figure out what the feeling of a pen is like. You can't do it online and you cannot go on anyone's advice, really, because everybody has different experiences, different preferences, different things that they like. I like some of the gold nibs I own are a little bouncy. And I like that. Some of them are very rigid. And in those nibs, I like that, too. Um, Omar's Paragon, the, the Grand Paragon I have, is a rigid nib. It's not, it's not bouncy. But then I have other gold nibs, uh, for example, uh, the Opera Elements, uh, uh, that is much softer. So all I'm trying to say is it is really hard. Have a realistic expectation and try out pens. That's the only way to figure out what you like. And there is no shortcut, unfortunately. Which kind of nib is writing best for Japanese? Well, I think you have the most affordable option would be something like a Fude nib. So a nib that is actually bent up. Those are meant to simu simulate brush strokes. Uh, that's, yeah, that, that would be the best thing, I think. And beyond that, you have all those Japanese specialty nibs, of course, uh, from Sailor, for example, but those get really quite expensive so you could have a food and nib for i don't know 20 30 dollars on a 
Sailor Food and Imanen, I think those are not super expensive. They're relatively affordable steel nibs and they, um, they, they work well. Yeah. What's your priority in spending money on this hobby? Well, yeah, I don't know if I truly have priority. Again, I'm not really buying much anymore because I'm, I'm satisfied with, with what I have. So I, I spend very little money on pens in general, to be honest. Now, when I do spend money, then it may be a lot of money. But I mean, at, at the end of the day, that's that's it. There isn't a whole lot uh, that I really, uh, really spend on it. I dilute inks with mixed results. Now, it strikes me that the surfactant in the ink will be diluted, making the ink drier. I should add some dish soap to the distilled water uh, I use to dilute ink. Yes, yes. At some point, I realized you can't just spend a month's salary on Sailor Ink since uh, Sailor Limited Editions exist. Nibs, custom feeds, nib grinders, paper, leather case, etc. need some love as well. Well, yeah. I think another thing that, that people underestimate is you don't... I've got the feeling I've said this a couple times. Um, enjoy what you have. If your collection is ten five dollar pens, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But if your collection is a hundred thousand dollar pens, yeah, that's fine too. It depends on what you want to do. But enjoy what you have, right? People often forget that, and I I feel that our society. I'm not going to go into some sort of hippie anti consumerism argument. But the reality is our society is very much set up along the lines of, oh, a shiny new thing. You have to buy this. Oh, a new sailor. Oh, a new sailor. Oh, a new sailor. Oh, a new Lamy. Oh, a new Lamy. Oh, a new sailor. But do you actually need those pens? If you already have 10 sailors, do you need the 11th sailor as well? In my mind, and your mileage may vary. For some people, the answer is yes, because it's a collection. I want to have them all. Okay, fine. But then that makes you happy. But don't blindly go for, oh, it's a new pen, I should probably buy this. Oh, it's a new shimmering ink. Oh, it's a new shading. Oh, it's a new sheen. Oh, it's a new... Ask yourself if you really want that thing. And if it's really going to bring you happiness. If it does and you can afford it, well, then buy it. But if it doesn't, you're just buying it because you think you're buying it because it's a trend. Well, then maybe don't do that thing. That's what I would say. Yeah, I was scroll. What will you do after spending time with us? I'm not sure yet. Pierre and I are trying to record something today. So um, I, that's going to happen at some point. Yeah. Random question. What scares you? Animal, insect, feelings, emotions? I'm not very partial to spiders which is kind of convenient living in the north because they all die off in winter. So I tell myself. What else? What's the largest amount of ink you've spilled in one go and what did it ruin? Uh, that's a good question. Um, The largest amount of ink I spilled was um, in a Laban little inkwell. It was Noodler's Dragon's Napalm, and I dropped it, and it was dropped on a, I want to say, a table next to a white wall and it was all over the wall and we immediately tried to clean it rent an apartment but it's noodless so it will survive nuclear winter um many layers of primer and paint and if you knew it was there you could still see it it just comes through the paint now this was maybe I think if it was the 30, 35, 40 milliliter inkwell, that should cover it. It wasn't huge, thank God. But that was interesting. 
I'll put it that way. Very interesting. So it basically ruined the wall. Yes. Do you rediscover pens you think you lost in your house 10 or 20 years ago? No, not really, because I kind of, I kind of keep them in the same space and I don't really... Uh, no, no, no. I know if people have done that, though. Yeah. Uh, um, what else do we have? What else do we have? I just received my first Twisby Diamond 580 rose gold for my birthday. Yeah, they are nice. Uh, they are, uh, I think the Twisbees are nice. They're, they're inexpensive pens that typically write well. And they've done something nice in making um, uh, making piston fillers and such quite readily available to, to the public, which I think is, is very nice. Yeah, yeah. Do you still have ferrets? Any pets? I didn't actually have ferrets, but I did have hamsters and rats at some point. I don't at this point have anything. Um, no, at this point I have nothing. That sounded really sad, didn't it? No, at this point I don't have any pets. No. Uh, what else? I'm starting a future learn online course in Arabic calligraphy tomorrow. It's free. I have to make a reed pen from bamboo, use a ban encre du chine ink for writing and 120 grams per square meter gloss paper. Oh, that sounds like fun. Arabic is very interesting. Um, that is something that I kind of have on my list to get into. Writing, learning to write in a new script I think is a lot of fun in general. And it, it's, um, it's a very nice, um, uh, it's a very nice thing to do and a very nice addition to your, your writing and way to use your pens because you can also write something that not, not everyone can write. And for some reason, that's just, it's just been fun to me. I had to learn ancient Greek in school. Um, and our teacher told us, and I always found that very interesting of course, in the Netherlands, we use just the, the regular Latin alphabet, same thing you use in English. And she said, the interesting thing is you all have your own handwriting in that alphabet that you've used and learned in school and all that. But now you're learning Greek and you'll develop your own handwriting in Greek as well, because you start off really copying the letters, just like the characters, just the way the teacher does it. But then indeed, you start to write them your own way, which is which I found fascinating. I know this is interesting to anyone, but I found that fascinating. Is there a point to a gold nib? Presumably the reason for a gold nib is that steel wasn't as high quality yesteryear and gold alloys allowed a level of flexibility not achievable in steel. Well, I think it's a fair question. At this point, we have such good stainless steel. Um, I sometimes wonder if there is an advantage to gold beyond it making the nib more expensive. We know that you can make flex nibs out of steel. See noodlers, see a fountain pen revolution. Um, that's possible. They've been making dib nibs out of steel for a long time. The traditional dib nibs, of course, did corrode, still actually corrode. But a good fountain pen nib, I always say, take, some, take a brand like Faber-Castell that makes many steel nibs that, in my mind, vastly outperform a number of gold nibs or palladium nibs on the market today. The only thing is they're stiff. They, they will not allow you line variation, but they are so smooth and they write so well. I don't see what the added value of a gold nib on those pens would be. Unless you need that, that bounciness. But as I, I've, I went over earlier today, and I've done this in many of these videos, I have used gold nibs that are as rigid as steel nibs. It's not a given that a gold nib will have that softness or, or, or bouncy feeling to it. Some are completely rigid. So you can't expect that that is what you get. And that's what I meant by you have to go to a shop. You have to try it out or a pen show or a pen club meeting or whatever. But you have to try out those nibs because it is not guaranteed that a gold, gold nib will be, will be 
rigid. It's not guaranteed that a steel nib uh, will will be rigid. Uh, a gold nib, will, sorry, gold nib will be bouncy, and a steel nib will be rigid. It's not guaranteed. <clears throat> How we got? Sorry. <clears throat> How did you get into the subject of psychology? And stoicism. Psychology, well, that I studied, of course, and I just found human behavior interesting, and I, I kept finding that interesting, so that's how I, I, I ended up there and, and made that a career. Stoicism is something that I have found very helpful uh, just in my private life. Everybody experiences setbacks in life. That's normal and just how, how life works. And I have found that stoicism is something that can... Uh, can really contribute to not taking away the pain or the grief or the those kinds of things, but that can help you process those things better. It remains hard, of course. What else? What else? Yes, the, yes, the apartment does allow pets, but I just never got around to it. Uh, what else? I'm trying to scroll again. Well, is speedball really made in China? I have no idea. Sorry. What else? Yeah, I, I, I think you're right. Gold doesn't corrode. That's why gold was used. Yes, absolutely. I, 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 I'm, I'm almost certain that it was. But again, we have much better steel alloys these days. And there's always the concern of people like, oh, but steel at some point it will rust. I guess, yeah. Truly, like there is nothing that is truly 100% um, stainless ever. I've never had a steel nib rust. And I've owned many, and I've used many, and I've had some uninked for a long time, and they still haven't rusted. Now, at some point down the line, they may. I don't even know if that will happen in my lifetime. So I don't always think that is as, as big an issue as, as people fear it is. I just put a titanium bog nib in my Ranga number three, and if I blindfold me, I tell you the pilot, it's a pilot soft, fine gold nib. Yeah, exactly. That's the thing. And that's also how I experience these things to be. If you take someone who owns the fanciest gold nibs in the world, then blindfold them, give them a Faber-Castell emotion nib, they'll say, yeah, it's a gold nib. It's less bouncy maybe than some of their nibs, but the smoothness is unparalleled. But remember, again, it's not the gold that touches the paper. It's just the tipping material, which is a hard metal, often not even iridium anymore, right? But it's just, it's just that. It's a hard metal. And it depends on how you polish that. The gold, yeah, sure, the gold tines, maybe they are a bit springier, uh, typically. But again, not always. So It seems that I think if a pen's going to cost a certain amount, it should be a gold nib. Is that unreasonable? I may be, it, may, it may be unreasonable. Yeah, it, it, it may be, but it depends. Like if you, if uh, I, I agree that at some point, if you're talking... I'm just making up this number, but if, if, if I would be buying a $500 pen, then I would kind of expect it to have a gold nib. Just because I don't see, like, even the gold nib is not going to contribute. That, think about how much gold is really in a nib. A gram? Maybe. If that, what does one gram of gold cost? Uh, what do we have? I don't know what that means. Can't read this table. One gram of gold. Current price, $66. So let's let's think about how many $500 pens we have with a gold nib. And then the nib contributes $66 to that, the cost of that pen. Right? So I do, I do, I do think it's not unfair to say at some point I would kind of expect a gold nib on this. And of course, there's the rarity of the material and the craftsmanship and how many are there, maybe the filling mechanism and how com complicated is that, uh, these kinds of things. So I don't think it's an unfair way to look at things. Yeah. What else? 
What is your view on Kindles? Yeah, these e-reader devices, I really like the concept of them. But I've used it. I, I got an app on my phone and I read some books on my phone. But for me, it's really not the same as holding a paper book. I think it's a generational thing. And I think there will be a time when people have grown up with screens so much that, that paper books don't really make sense to them anymore. But I'm not quite there yet. I also dislike having to read something, a long text on a screen. I just, I just don't find it comfortable. That may be a psychological thing, I don't know. But I don't, it's never really appealed to me all that much. It's really nice because you can keep an entire library with you at all times, but I just, yeah. Uh, what else? Do you see a difference in text you write with different pens with the same nib width? If they have exactly the same nib width, maybe, maybe. Again, if one nib is a little bit more elastic than another nib, then you might you might see a bit of a difference. But I don't think it's, yeah. I don't know if you would see a whole a big difference. I thought you finished at 11. Yeah, I thought that too, but I thought I would go just a little longer. That's what I told her. Stoicism seems to help me feel more in control of myself. Yeah, 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 for me too. I think that's that's... Yeah, it's a hard practice, but I do think you can make that difference. How do you reconcile with a pen that you're not sure whether to keep? If it doesn't do anything for me, then I don't make any efforts to reconcile. And I don't think I've really been wrong about those kinds of things in the past. Where I really regretted that to a tremendous degree later. It's like, like books, like you can read a book and then you think this is not... I don't, I'm not enjoying this. Well, then what's the point in finishing it if you don't, like, it's just not for you. That's fine. So many different pens out there that it, I, I don't think it's, um, yeah. That's just the way it is. There's something for everyone, I think. I have a Visconti breeze. The nib is very bouncy. It, I can easily flex it a bit and create some variation in my handwriting. It's softer than some of my gold nibs. Yeah, it can be. Yeah. I sense your love for Pelican has softened. Is it for aesthetics or functional reasons that you parted? Maybe a bit of both, but I just didn't like, I, I, again, it's just a matter of, do you use the pens you own? If you don't really use them, now what's the point in owning them? And, and that to me is a very important thing. Like I don't, I just, I just don't want to hold on to that if I don't actually use it. What else? I'd love to see some new materials tested for nibs. It does seem like new materials research probably has some nice surprises that could be applied to pens. Yeah, and same thing for feeds. Well, yeah, you had the, the pen family that of course started to use aluminum for feeds. Um, yeah, why not? Right? Uh, and for nibs as well, I'm sure there are other options. Because indeed, there are alloys that, you know, you could try something new. Kind of related to corrosion, to what extent do you think it's reasonable to expect a vintage pen to be in excellent condition? Well, that depends on the seller, right? Like if you, if it's described as excellent, then you might hope it would be excellent. If it is not, then it is not. Very often, there are interesting things. I once bought a, a Parker... 25, I think it was, Parker 25 Flighter on eBay uh, that said, um, did a dip test, rode perfectly. I got it. And in, indeed, with the dip test, it rode perfectly. But when you would fill it with ink, it didn't, right? Because it turned out that the entire feed, and that's a big feed with a lot of little fins in it, uh, was clogged up with India ink. So sure, I mean, if you dip it, it will write a few words. 
but you couldn't actually use it the way it was meant to be used. So I had to sonicate that, take the whole thing apart, sonicate it, which fortunately I could. It was a pen that could be disassembled like that. And then it was fine. And then it wrote, but I had to do that work. So you have to be very careful. Unfortunately, there are no guarantees. Not all eBay vendors are honest. Some are. They will have high ratings. Some are not. They will not have high ratings. If you go to people you know, then you know. Like I would, for example, uh, penboard.de. Uh, I can pretty much guarantee you that if you buy something from Tom Westerich and he says, this is an excellent condition, then that pen will be in excellent condition. Because that's an honest person who has sold a lot of stuff, who has a good reputation, very good reputation in the pen community. Like these, you know, that, that will make a difference. But yeah, if you buy the pen from Joe Sixpack on eBay, who is also selling toilet paper uh, and car parts, does he care about the pen or is he just trying to make money, right? So the image of Joe Sixpack made me laugh a bit. But anyway, like you, you, you understand what I mean. There is, there is no guarantees online, right? And it goes for anything. What else? I really enjoy IG, so uh, uh, iron gold ink. So I find myself needing gold or titanium nibs, but wanting the firmness of steel. Well, uh, as I said, take take something like the Pilot Three, sorry, the Platinum Three Seven Seven Six music nib. That is an incredibly rigid fourteen K nib. So they, they 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 exist. They they exist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Scrolling. Probably over scroll again. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, definitely over scrolling. Uh, do you still have the gold parkers which you got from your grandfather? Yes, and I do still use them. Yes. How many pens do you own if you are anti-consumerism? I haven't counted, but I think something like 35 or so. Uh, what else? I appreciate your broadcast chats. You help me to think about how to use what you have and cease the insane acquiring. Yeah, and let me like re-emphasize, if, if that is what you like doing, if it gives you pleasure to to do collect a lot of things like we have someone like that in the calgary pen club who just really likes to buy things and every time we we talk he has between three and five new pens every week um that's fine if that is something that that you find enjoyable but to me that is not enjoyable it's just not and i i don't like that and i don't like to amass huge numbers of things and i definitely don't like doing that simply because it's the latest fad and this again i've said a number of times but that is what happens in the pen world a lot there are a lot of fads whether it's flex nibs or whether it's oh now everybody needs a shading ink now everybody needs a shimmering ink now everybody needs a sheening ink but do you really want that or are you doing that because everybody on Instagram is doing it, makes it looks good, makes it look good, and now I want that thing too, right? This may be a weird thing to say because, as I've talked about earlier, I, I, I also like to make pens look good. Not lying, but like to make pens look good, right? Because I think every pen has some sort of redeeming quality. It doesn't matter whether it's expensive or whether it's inexpensive. But at the end of the day, I have no real horses in this game because uh, whether you buy it or not, I don't see a penny for that. So I don't really care. Um, I'm just saying that this is a pen that I enjoyed. This is why, or this is something that didn't really work for me. So yes, I find that attitude important. Enjoy what you do have. Use what you do have as opposed to maybe owning 1,500 fountain pens and using the same three every time because you bought the rest just to buy pens. Just saying. Uh, 
What else? Which Sonic Cleaner would you recommend? Oh, I have something I just got on Amazon. It was one of the first things that popped up. I think it paid something like $35 or $40 for it, and it's fine. I don't think it really matters a whole lot. I, they're all, they do the same thing, right? So it doesn't have to be a super expensive unit that, you know, with, with a, a, like a, a 10 liter capacity because you're going to put small parts in it anyway, right? What else? Thinking about getting a Pelican M600, is there a better pen in that price range? Probably. There are hundreds of pens in that price range, right? So it, it really depends on what you want um, and what you look for. I think the M600 is a nice pen. Yeah. Do you think it is possible to rewire the brain through meditation and or other methods uh, to a degree, yes. To a degree, yes. Just like people can also recover from traumas, etc. Um, I do think that the extent to which those things work has sometimes been exaggerated in, in especially social media, these kinds of things. Um, and that... I think is the bigger issue, but are there known benefits of meditation? Yeah. You can also have a discussion about some of those findings, whether they are as robust as uh, they're made to seem, but you can definitely do. I, I think you can definitely do a bit of rewiring. Anything that you learn, for example, is on the spot rewiring of your brain. So you can, we know that the brain is, is uh, uh, plastic, especially when you're younger, it becomes a little less plastic when you get a bit older, but even then you can, there are some changes you can make. Um, just be a bit critical and skeptical of the types of claims again that are made. Like I keep getting an, uh, an, an ad on Instagram about detoxing your pineal gland. Um, first of all, detoxing is not really a scientific thing. Like detoxing your liver, I mean, your liver filters out things. There is nothing to detox. So that's something that people buy into massively. Your pineal gland releases melatonin and it makes you fall asleep. There's nothing to detox. Like that's, that's not how that works. So, but people see that and then they are swayed by, oh my God, I've never detoxed my pineal gland. I must be on the verge of death, you know, which doesn't actually make any sense. This was a mild detour, uh, but, I, but I, I do sometimes get concerned about those kinds of uh, things. Yeah. Is it weird that Arco reminds me of seared chicken? As long as it doesn't bother you, I don't think it's weird. No. Could one put a Sonicare toothbrush in a tub with the pen parts to get a similar result? I actually don't know if that would generate enough vibrations, but that would be an interesting thing to try out. You should do that and report back. I don't know if it would have if the toothbrush would be able to generate waves that are powerful enough to really have an effect but that is definitely an interesting thought the the ultrasonic cleaners do serve a good purpose because you are able to get into little nooks and crannies of for example feeds that have a lot of you know little folds and such um, that you you just can't clean uh, manually so i think i think that is uh yeah it's worth getting, yeah. Speaking of Arco, why are they so valued? Because there's a market for them and people want them. At the end of the day, it's just like another celluloid, but it is, I mean, it's, it's just a pretty celluloid, right? What do I have inked up now? I have one, yes. I mean, it's pretty, I think. Is it prettier than um, any of the other classic Omar celluloids like the Burkina or the... Uh, 
uh, was that Scarlet? The anyway, this, is it is it better? I don't know, but people um, pay for it, right? They 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 pay, and that creates the market. I think for the first time ever, we seem to have made it through the question. So it was very nice to see you all. I hope you all have a great week ahead. For those of you who say, I wish I could support SBRE Brown. Don't forget that there is patreon.com slash SBRE Brown. And if you don't, that's perfectly fine too. And I will still love you. Right? Right. But just saying. Um, have a good week. I'll see you all next time. I'll announce it once again. Oh, sorry. I'll announce it <clears throat> once again on Instagram when we are doing the next one. Bye.